Okay, plenty of seats for everybody. <laughs> Hurry up. Yeah. Should I start playing? Yes. You can go ahead and play the prelude. Let's see, we're playing, I believe, for the prelude, right? Yes, I am. Okay. We'll do that before we do the welcome and announcements while the crowd's making their way down the aisle. So they will be moving their fellowship from their place on Yankee Road 
I believe that that sold or is in the process of being sold. They'll be moving downtown. And uh, Bill Ross, who I spoke with at this social occasion, he um, uh, basically invited us all once they get settled to come and visit them. So that's my announcements. So change is taking place everywhere, not just here. Yes. So <clears throat> don't feel isolated uh, in, in that everybody is going through the same thing. And actually, uh, Derek will be here at the, for the board afterwards to discuss this, the ninth. And uh, we've, we're talking about trying to do the union service the 7th, July 7th. Uh, we'll probably try and do the picnic thing again out at the shelter. That worked pretty good the last time. So we'll see if we can do something like that again. Uh, we want to form as close an attachment or get to know the people from El Dorado uh, as, as well as we can as time goes along here. Uh, and so need, people need to be aware of uh, all the possibilities and that's what we'll be discussing. Okay, any other announcements? Today is Mother's Day, Happy Mother's Day. Uh, we'll be talking about Mother's Day. Uh, our pictures will be Mother's Day. But uh, I have to warn you is I tend to be, I guess, pulling the band-aids off a little cuts and bruises and things. So this will be the board. What we'll be talking about today is maybe the little darker side. We're not going to do the, the standard Happy Mother's Day and everything is nice and bright and beautiful. Uh, we're going to do a little bit on the, the more dysfunctional side of Mother's Day. So, chalice lighting. Even in the most broken places, there's room for love. Mother's Day is complicated, joyful for many, yes, but complicated. It's right there on the calendar, even if your mother has died. Even if you've been told yet again that you're not pregnant, or if you've never been more scared than you are right now because you are pregnant, it's Mother's Day. Even if your own mother's priorities included everything but you, there's going to be a Mother's Day Google Doodle with flowers and pink stuff. Even if you have scars, once ones you can see or ones you can't, it's Mother's Day. That cake mix commercial is going to roll out four times an hour, even when you can't stop shaking and crying because you can't believe you slapped your little boy today. It's Mother's Day. And we all have to live with that in those silent, breathless moments because even when the baby dies, it's Mother's Day. And so let's go to church. Let's be a church where we can acknowledge how difficult it is to have this day, right alongside how joyful this day can be. Let's be a church where we don't pretend there aren't achy depths of space between us even when we sing. Let's be a church that fills the space between our differences with love, because even in the most broken places, there is room for love. We can be that church. Our opening hymn is number 87. Nearer my God to thee. That's the ending hymn. That's the ending hymn? Yeah, 355. So let's put uh, 355. Okay.
All right. see page numbers in the hymn, but where's the page numbers? It doesn't take much to confuse me. So <laughs> Well you're you're at home in the right place. Uh, and, and the older I get the worse I get. <laughs> Once again, you're in good company. Alright, uh, our affirmation. Come in, be among us. Oh let me get to the, the next slide. Uh, once again, Classic Mother's Day. To all who are yearning for community, come in, be among us. To all who are just getting started, to all who long to go deeper, to all with tender places needing care, come in, be among us. To the ones who have healed and have care to give, for those who are curious and hungry to learn, for those who know why they have something to teach, come in, be among us. For the ones who are just beginning to suspect they might nurture others becoming, to the young and the old, the innocent, the jaded, the fresh of mind, and to the deeply steeped, there is room for each and every one. Come in and be among us. All right, our children's story. Everybody knows what this is? Beaver. Leave it to Beaver. <laughs> the classic good family. The ancient Greeks were among the first to pay tribute to Bach, sort of. Their spring festival honored Rhea, the mother of all Greek gods. That holiday didn't pan out. In medieval Britain, servants were given the fourth Sunday of Lent to travel home and spend the day with their moms. This custom was called Mothering Sunday. But the modern era Mother's Day was created by Anna Marie Jarvis. Anna admired her mother, who attended to the wounded during America's Civil War, and later became a community activist. When young Anna was 12, it is believed she heard her mother pray that one day there might be a Memorial Day for mothers for all the good that they do. Young Anna never forgot the prayer, and when her mom died in May of 1905, the plan for a holiday was born. On the second anniversary of her mom's death, Anna held a church memorial dedicated to her mother's good deeds. In May of 1908, Anna held another memorial and handed out white carnations, her mom's favorite flower. She contacted Philadelphia philanthropist John Wanamaker who joined a Mother's Day committee in hopes of honoring all mothers all across the nation. In 1910, West Virginia became the first state to observe the second Sunday in May as Mother's Day. After a fierce letter-writing campaign, Anna got Congress to federally recognize the holiday. And in 1914, President Wilson signed a bill that officially made the second Sunday in May Mother's Day. The holiday was meant to be spent in church. Afterwards, sons and daughters would write loving letters to their mothers. Carnations were worn that day. Pink or red honored living mothers, and white honored moms who had passed. With each year, more and more Mother's Day carnations were sold. And by 1920, reading card companies got into the Mother's Day biz. Anna was enraged by what she considered a lazy excuse for letters that should be handwritten. By 1924, the holiday creator was so appalled with the commercialization of Mother's Day that she petitioned to abolish it. In 1930, Anna was arrested for disturbing the peace at a Mother's Day carnation sale. Sadly, Anna spent the rest of her life and family inheritance fighting the holiday. She died in 1948, leaving no children to remember her. 
Since then, Mother's Day has become one of the most profitable holidays for florists and the phone company's highest volume day of the year. This probably wouldn't have pleased Anna, but deep down she would have to be satisfied that on her Mother's Day, millions of moms around the world receive extra attention and well-deserved hugs. A true story of reality. The lady that started Mother's Day protested the commercialization of Mother's Day, which we all know is going to happen uh, no matter what, uh, and yet lived out her life bitter and angry, <laughs> trying to, to disestablish, trying to cancel the day that she had established. Uh, the human spirit goes in many, many strange directions and Mother's Day is really one of them. And that's the reason uh, we're gonna talk about Mother's Day. Uh, joys and concerns. I uh, wanna uh, light a candle for Cecil, who is suffering from shingles, which is very painful and very uh, debilitating, very uncomfortable. And there really isn't much you can do for that. There's salves you can put on it and you can take pain medication, but there's really, there's no real cure for it. Uh, there's a vaccination. I encourage everybody to get the vaccination. Uh, as of now, well, up until last year, uh, Medicare did not cover it. And it was like a $500 shot. So, but starting last year, the pharmacy notified me that Medicare does cover your, your shingles vaccination. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage, and. There's kind of a myth that if you've had shingles before, you can't get them again. That's not true. So get the shingles vaccination, even if you've had shingles in the past. Uh, and the shingles vaccination won't stop you from getting shingles, but hopefully it's kind of like the flu shot. It will lessen the severity and shorten the time that you're going to have to suffer with it. Uh, so far, I've been lucky and haven't had it, although and I'm sure almost every one of us had chicken pox when we were kids, which is the, the origin of shingles. It's the chicken pox virus hides out in your body and flares up uh, as you get older, sometimes caused by stress um, or getting, can't find the right number in the hymn book, that kind of thing. Okay. I have a concern. Yes. Um, the, um, seems like maybe the college protests have abated a bit for whatever reason, but let's hope that the discussion, meaningful discussion and resolution, compromise, negotiations, and what have you, diplomacy will alleviate at least the pain and suffering of those many individuals in, in Gaza, Palestine, but also to lead to the recovery of hostages. We can only hope that that is still a very viable um, uh, outcome and let's hope for resolution once and for all for those, those terrible last few months since October strife and warfare and the joy that I have to, to would like to share with all of us is we have joy in our presence because Dolly is about to embark on a wonderful trip <laughs> and she I'm sure will tell us about it in during social hour but we wish her the very best sounds like you'll be glad to get rid of me <laughs> not, not at all not at all and we we'll look forward to hearing from you on your voyage yes but more importantly we wish you the best Take lots of pictures. So we light a candle for Dolly. Uh, Dolly's uh, travel mercies, uh, that everything goes well, all the flights are on time, uh, there's no delays, uh, and no natural disasters <laughs> anywhere along the way, <laughs> which seems to be more and more prevalent. Actually, we got three candles uh, from Mike's presentation. One candle for the college kids who are, and it's kind of strange to see, and it kind of reminds me if anybody lived through the 60s, uh, sometimes you protest because everyone else is protesting and you're not really sure what the, the, the stress, the impetus is on. Uh, most of these are pro-Palestinian, which, and sometimes they overlook what the Hamas did to the Israelis, uh, which does not justify what the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians, but two wrongs don't make a right, which is kind of what we're pushing towards here. So we look, we advocate for common sense and sens sensitivity to other people's feelings and other people's position. Then to the Israelis and the Palestinians for the struggles they're going through. Uh, talks have broken down between Hamas and Israel. They were uh, reaching on accord uh, to, to have a peace, uh, a time of peace in Palestine and Gaza. 
those have broken down. The Israelis are now invading Ramallah and, uh, and dropping bombs again. The United States has withheld sending the Israelis the bombs to drop there. So now half the people are mad about that and half the people like it. Uh, and then the families of the hostages, there was another hostage announced was killed in the bombing. Uh, according to Hamas, it was killed in the bombing. So the, the lives of the hostages are getting more and more precarious as uh, time lengthens and time goes along. So it's just a terrible situation. And then uh, we still have our sunflowers from Ukraine. The Russians are advancing, have taken five more villages, uh, partially thanks to the conservative American Congress who has withheld supply, supplies, ammunition, and uh, material to the Ukrainians. Uh, that is now back on the way again. Uh, hopefully the Ukrainians can, can defend themselves. There is a terrible problem going on in Ukraine because they're running out of soldiers uh, and people are, they're just running out of people to throw into the battle. And the Russians are basically just scooping up anybody and throwing them into the battle. And it's been a Russian tradition for generations, World War II, World War I. Millions, literally millions of Russians were sacrificed uh, in the war effort for no reason other than to just to continue the war effort. So uh, we'll light a candle for the Russian population who is being uh, taken advantage of. All right, anything else? Uh, we need to light a candle for Greenville. A storm last week, oh man. Electricity was out in the town for two or three days. I'm not sure it's completely restored yet. The park was devastated. Everybody has trees down. I drove along Ohio Street yesterday. Uh, definitely signs of a tornado. Giant, huge trees uprooted, completely uprooted. Other giant trees, two and three feet across with the tops torn right off of them uh, and like twisted off. So the, the, trunk is, the trunk is sticking up there 30 or 40 feet and then there's no tree at the top. The top is just gone. So that had to have been a tornado. Luckily, that didn't pass down close to the ground because the houses weren't touched. Well, a few of them lost shingles, but the trees were just devastated. And Greenville has always been a city of trees, a beautiful city with lots of beautiful trees. So, and planting new trees is going to take a hundred years before that comes back again. So, the candle for the park was really hit. What's that? The park, the city park. The city park. Eighty uh, percent of their trees are lost. 80%. Oh my gosh. And the park was a beautiful place. Yeah, I have uh, one of our friends from the LBGTQ lives next to the park and walked through and did a video of the park and just yeah, the devastation was just unbelievable. So a candle for Greenville. Uh, I'm not sure there's any way. I see the city trucks are out uh, picking up the brush and things off the sides of the streets and time will heal and life will go on and we'll plant new trees. Uh, we just have to be aware. I guess the main thing is that's the second tornado in Greenville in two months. The other one passed just north of Greenville. If you do not have a storm shelter or a place to go at a time of storm, you need to think seriously about creating one. Uh, we have a crawl space which has like a little trap door and both of us are getting too old to go down there. So I've got uh, plans to build a secure little place in our garden shed with uh, railroad ties. We're going to build an actual little uh, room on a safe room out of railroad ties, uh, which I, I think would be safe from a, a uh, tornado. So that's in the in the works. If my guys ever show up to work, <laughs> any other announcements, or joys, or concerns? Okay, I hope everybody who's uh, not here today is having a good time with their families. Uh, Mother's Day is an important day. It brings those emotions to the surface. Sometimes the emotions it brings to the service are not the best emotions. Uh, Mother's Day is one of those like leave it to beaver days when we, just like the uh, little program showed, people send cards and uh, have a dinner and everybody, has, you know, celebrates the good times of Mother's Day. But every family, every person did not enjoy that kind of a Mother's Day. Uh, sometimes, not everyone has that leave it to beaver experience. Uh, some mothers are not able through no fault of their own to be the perfect mother. Uh, you may have been part of that family. You may have known, I'm sure you knew other families where the mother wasn't exactly the perfect example. 
And sometimes it's hard to be the perfect example of a mother because the kids are not perfect example of kids. So there's a family dynamic that uh, goes on there. So uh, the reason this is kind of important to me and the reason I'm talking about it is I have personal experience with it. Uh, not that my mother was a, a difficult or a, a, she was more of a, a distant mother, I guess I would say, but Tara's mother, Tara's family, particularly her mother, was a very difficult situation. She was a, she had four sisters, three sisters, four girls all together. The family was the standard middle-class uh, American wasp, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, Calvinist type family, whatever the father says goes, everybody obeys, everybody does what they're told to do, nobody speaks up. Uh, if any of you know Tara, she, that's impossible for her to do. She, she can't not speak up. She can't not be the independent person that she is. And she struggled with her family from the time she was a small child. Uh, they never physically, well, they did hit her occasionally, she says, but it wasn't like physical abuse. But it's the constant mental abuse saying that you are not what you're supposed to be. You're not the person that everybody, that all your sisters are. Uh, and it was a deep-seated thing that I'm not sure how much was intentional uh, and how much just was her family's reaction to something, to a, a life force that they couldn't control. But the expression of it was pretty strange and I, knew, I noticed that when I met her and started to get involved with her family. For her birthday, her mother would give her things that she bought at Goodwill. Hmm. Used clothing that she bought at Goodwill for her birthday. <coughs> and if, if all the other family had gotten that, it would be nothing unusual. But when the other family gets new presents and Tara got the, the hand-me-downs and the leftovers, that's kind of a pretty... <laughs> and that's, I was kind of amazed that the family, did they realize what they were doing or was it just something that was subconscious? That kind of thing went on the whole time. And what strikes me and what I find interesting about human behavior and human and people is that she still craved the approval of her parents. She went to every family reunion. Every time there was a family group, that was imperative that we went. And we were dairy farmers. It was not easy for us to go. Uh, I had, that was my excuse. We got to leave because I have to get home and milk the cows. Uh, and that got us out of some pretty difficult situations. But every time and it, she was really wanted to be a part of her extended family and really felt close to her extended family and was treated in a way that was, I found just from looking at a distance where I came in, very astounding, uh, very difficult. Uh, and she is still working through that now. And her parents have both died and she felt, and it was pretty amazing too, no remorse whatsoever when her parents died, none. All those years of bitterness have come out and she didn't say anything bitter, but there was no, and we talked about it and she talked about, she's told me about what her life was like and the difficulties that she went through. So I know from her experience that not everybody has a perfect Mother's Day, not everybody has a perfect mother, but there are reasons for that. Uh, and there's five myths about motherhood that we're going to talk about a little. Uh, but these motherhood myths make it, imp make it impossible for women who are floundering with mothering to get help because everyone expects them to be the perfect mother. They act as a social barrier to prevent people from seeing maternal neglect and maternal verbal abuse. Some of these make mothers feel like failures and others excuse the abuse. The myth of what it means to be a woman is based on caretaking, not personhood. Mothers, women are, are judged on what kind of mothers they are. They're judged on how their children turn out to be, not who they are as a person, but how they act as a mother. In a society where childcare is expensive and difficult to find, Motherhood is supposed to be the natural expression of human love. This isn't to say that there haven't been some cultural breakthroughs uh, that helped enrich the dialogue. One such moment uh, 20 years ago, if you remember when Brooke Shields went public with her postpartum depression, that brought a sea change in the way motherhood was, was seen by the general public. Postpartum depression and the fact that not all mothers are perfect mothers after birth
became a, a public thing that people acknowledged and basically tried to do something about. Uh, that effectively gave voice to women who suffered in shame and silence. If a famous, wealthy, physically beautiful woman who was once the model for the perfect infant on ivory snow had just given birth to another gorgeous infant she had tried to, to conceive for two years could be so unhappy, then anybody could be unhappy. A quote from her was, I felt completely overwhelmed. This baby was a stranger to me. I didn't know what to do with her. I didn't feel at all joyful. I attributed feelings of doom to simple fatigue and figured that they would eventually go away, but they didn't. In fact, they got worse. I couldn't bear the sound of the baby crying, and I dreaded the moments my husband would bring her to me. I wanted her to disappear. I wanted to disappear. At my lowest point, I thought of swallowing a bottle of pills or jumping out the window of my apartment." Unquote. The mother's myths don't just affect women also. Men too are both consciously and unconsciously affected by them. They permeate the whole of society and it's thinking about motherhood and parenting generally. So Brooke Shields brought to life that feeling of abandonment, that feeling of depression, that postpartum depression that is now recognized and treated, but it's treated with medication, which doesn't always work and also has side effects. But at least now we are aware that every mother is not perfectly joyful when their child arrives. Okay, the myths uh, have a very long history, doubtlessly beginning with humanity's observation that the female of every species is capable of giving birth, not only conceiving the baby, carrying the baby, giving birth to the baby, and feeding the baby, which makes you wonder what is the man's contribution? About five minutes, basically. So, uh, but an interesting fact, let me just throw this in, seahorses are the only creatures where the males and females both give birth. And I didn't have time to look up to see how the males do that, but I'm, that'll be for a future time. The superseding of the old pagan traditions by Christianity actually strengthened the mythology with the introduction of the cult of the Virgin Mary. Among the key myths are the idealization of motherhood. It's pretty impossible to understate the influence of Christianity in the imagery and stories associated with the Virgin Mary. It's a very short leap from the images of the Virgin with the infant Jesus in her arms to the paintings of Renoir and Mary Cassette. It's especially mixed with religiosity. It spurs on seeing motherhood as some kind of a calling rather than the job that it truly is. Being a mother is work. It is uh, looked at as something that you're spiritually born to do as a natural thing, and it's not always natural to every person. The idealization of motherhood, combined, when it's combined with the idea of a calling, means, even, means a woman who doesn't have children for whatever reason is a second-class citizen. If you ever worked at a place that finds itself shorthanded, you will probably note that the women without children are always asked to come in and do the extra work, uh, as if not having children means you don't have an important life. That mothering is instinctual. This is myth number two. Nope, nope, nope. It is actually a learned behavior as it isn't for other animals. This belief that human females are hardwired to know how to best care for their children has implications that are absolutely enormous. And of course, undercuts every mother who finds the tasks of parenting impossible or difficult to do. This belief hovers in the courtrooms and lots of other places that it shouldn't, and of course is the foundation for unloving and neglectful mother's insistence that she is the final authority on child's welfare. This myth is used to justify verbal abuse. The foster care system is still trying to deal with the primacy of the family. Keeping the family intact has always been the goal, and sometimes the children are sacrificed to that goal. 
I can't tell you how many times, and I've told you examples of the foster kids that we had that waited for the appointed visitation of their parents on Christmas or holidays who never showed up. The courts go to an extraordinary degree to keep families together, even though those families shouldn't be together. They've proven over and over again that they can't be kept together. It's an impossible Solomonic decision to make for the courts. And you know the story of Solomon. Uh, Solomon. Two women claimed one child. He proposed dividing the child in half and giving one half to each woman. One woman said, yes, that's perfect. The other woman cried out and said, my baby, my baby, give my baby to the other woman and save his life. That was the real mother. And that was Solomon's trick to find out who really cared about the mother. But it is a simple but impactful decision that we see in the courts who gets the child. And that happens actually in divorce courts. You'll see that many times. People will fight for the control of the children, not because they love the children, not because they care of the children, because it hurts the other person if they can get control of the person. And how does a judge decide who is faking and who really wants that child? Uh, and it's a sad situation. The kids are drawn into that and asked to take sides, and that complicates the matter even farther. Myth number three, that all women are by nature nurturing. It is not hard to pick out as one of the most damaging of the myths because some women are nurturing and do that by life, do that by instinct, and they're nurturing not only to their children, they're nurturing to the people around them, they're nurturing to the life around them, to animals, to plants. Uh, they just want things to grow and flower and be successful. But not all women have that ability. And what happens is their judgments and settings and in divorce courts are called into question. It's not hard to see why that women who are forthright and speak their minds are often labeled unfeminine or harpies, especially if their voices are critical and tough. This myth paints womanhood and femininity, femininity in pastel hues as being soft and caring and loving and not decision-making and decisive. The fourth myth is bonding. If your infant, when you bond with your infant, uh, it supposedly happens instantly when that baby is pulled from the womb and placed on your breast, uh, naked and dirty. Uh, that's supposed to be instant bonding. It does not always happen. The Brooke Shields story should give us all pause, but you don't need postpartum depression to explain why dysfunction in a family can start at birth and why instantaneous bonding is a myth that sometimes damages women. Yet there is a process of bonding with you and your child that takes place over time and is built through attunement, which includes the mother's eye contact with the baby, her responsiveness to his or her cries, feeding the infant and more. And yes, some women will feel that emotional bond immediately, but many will not. Why? Being in pain for one thing, or being disappointed with how the birth went, or another, or being exhausted, or being exasperated with having to have another child that they did not want. But again, the myth, encourage, the myth encourages new mothers to feel shame if they don't love that baby instantaneously. And anytime your an emotion is foisted on you from the outside, it is not a healthy situation. Myth number five, all women, all mothers love unconditionally. This is the big kahuna of myths, especially if you are a child and you hear it as an unchallenged truth. Then kids ask, what is wrong with me that I am not loved? Is it something I did? Am I just unlovable? Kids and sometimes other adults don't have the overview, the distance, the perspective to see that there is another answer, to see that it is not their fault that their mother doesn't love them that their mother abuses them, that their mother disparages them. Uh, it is a very hard struggle to fight your way through if you don't feel cared for in your family, to find that self-respect, to find that individuality to make your life a better life without the support of your family. 
So there is a fifth theory about this myth, given that love is hard to find and harder even to hold on to in this world, most people believe they need to believe in one kind of love that is, in, that is perfect, that is never in doubt, that never fails, and the best candidate for that love is mother love. That's the one love that everybody believes is automatic and happens instantaneously. That helps this myth to be continued. Just note that the mythology pertaining to motherhood is, has no equivalent with men. There's no myth of fatherhood, of fathers being instant fathers, fathers being perfect fathers. Uh, fathers are known to be imperfect uh, and are not expected to be perfect. There are expectations that they perform, they supply the, the economic needs of their family. And as we progress with psychology and how understanding of families go, we are becoming to expect more from fathers and you'll see that in, the, in fiction, in movies, in TV shows uh, about what fathers should be. Uh, and that is progress, but it is not enough. So the myths of motherhood don't hurt just mothers, they can hurt all of us. Unloving mothers do not reliably respond to their children as infants or model a world for them that can be trusted. An unattuned mother will insert herself into her baby's space, misreading the signals, including when the child needs to be independent. Unloving mothers will often engage in verbal abuse, targeting a child's personality, looks, or actions. This is what happened to Tara as she was growing up. Uh, when she was, I think, seven years old, she was chosen as the mascot for the, the high school basketball team in their small town of Rowan, Indiana. And at halftime, she would come out and dance at the center thing while the cheer team was doing their cheers. Uh, she was the center of attention at seven years old, and she's loved it ever since. Her parents did not understand that. They did not support that. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly why, and I never actually talked to them about any of that stuff. Uh, in Anna Karina, Tolstoy observed that happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. I'm not so sure I agree 100% with that. Happy families are not always all alike, but I agree 100%. Every unhappy family is unhappy in their own way. All right, uh, mothers uh, with a combative style create an atmosphere which is a daughter or a son learns to self-protect and squash those emotional responses. And I've had experience with that, and I'm sure all of you have. When you get involved in a dispute with your parents, which happens over and over, it's a really strange thing. You go back and say, I am not gonna do that again. I am gonna react differently the next time. The next time the situation comes up, the exact same situation, the exact same drama unfolds, the same accu accusations or anger or uh, disappointments are voiced, and the same response is the same response that is given. Uh, I've experienced that with my father, uh, and I'm sure a lot of other people have too. There is a natural occurrence that happens in your emotional life that you would think there would be a way you could control it uh, in your mind, and for some reason, maybe it does happen, and maybe that's something you need to be aware of and talk about. Maybe it can happen. Uh, it never happened with me, and I don't think it ever happened with Tara. Uh, hopefully, it's something that can happen if people understand what is going on. And that's basically what I wanted to talk about, was that you need to be aware of what's going on. You need to talk with someone or think through what's going on. So you don't, because everybody says, I'm never going to be what my parents were. I'm never going to do what my parents did. And if you look, it happens over and over again. The way your parents reacted is the way you internalized, and sometimes you will react in the same way. Uh, it's kind of frightening to see, and it's, un it's unfortunate to see many times as well. Okay, comments, questions? Tim, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you did this sermon this way. Um, you, you helped me um, um, with my thoughts and feelings about my mother. Um, I, uh, I'm a person who is real hard on people. I hold a grudge. Um, I don't have, unless I'm in a bar and I'm confronted with some guy that's a lot bigger than me, 
I have no fear of saying what I think about something in the face, um, even if it's real derogatory. And my mother was exactly like that. And so she and I did not get along. <laughs> and when I came back from the Army, I was, I was gone for four years. When I came back, I was 23 years old, and I was an adult. I'd been through the military. I'd been to Europe. Um, I was an adult, and my mother still wanted to treat me like a little kid. Um, and of course, I'm. That's another place I do not like people telling me what to do. And so, when she continued to do it, I, I, I've said to other people here in church before. My mother and I were a perfect storm. We were alike in all the wrong ways. And we were different in all the wrong ways. And so it was a perfect storm. And I, and I think part of my problem is I might have expected too much from her. But I never realized that until I listened to what you had to say this morning. And so you've given me um, something to think about. I, I, as I get older and hopefully wiser, I, I've been trying to. I've got an Afghan on my couch. My mother loved me. I've got an afghan on my couch, a daisy afghan, and it's made of squares, you know. And to, to have done that, it took forever to do that. I just mentioned one time that I like daisy afghans and she made me one. Mm -hmm. So I know she loved me, um, but we just did not get along. And, and so I, I think I really need, I've been trying to, um, be forgiving and a little bit more understanding. And you brought up some really good points. I think maybe I might have expected more of her. Um, she might have been, uh, she loved my sister and I, but um, there were things she did, did that would, uh, and if my sister was here, I think she would sit. Cindy got along with her better than I did, mm -hmm. a lot better. But Cindy would still probably tell you that her and my dad both did things they shouldn't have done. I think you've hit, you brought up the most important point, which I guess I never really did. You need to be forgiving, not just understanding. Understanding maybe is the first step if you understand what your parents were like, because their lives are not perfect. They had parents, they inherited things and were formed by what happened with their parenting yeah. situation. So we need to learn to be forgiving, but not forgiving in the sense that we would replicate we would do the same thing that they did even though we try and say I'm never going to do that and we try not to and it still seems to happen we still can stop that from happening we still can change the way we do it my personal situation uh, my mom was very reserved and private and never really shared much and was not very supportive and when she died she had uh, uterine cancer and chose not to do anything about it she was 94 years old so we kept her at home in the farm and she just basically lived out her last few days. And every time when I was a nurse then, every day I had off, I went up because my brother was taking care of her. I went up to give him a day off. So he and his wife left and I stayed with my mom the whole day. This went on for like six months before she died. In that six months, at least one or two days a week, every week, I would drive up there two and a half hours and spend the day with her. Uh, and I had to change her diapers. I had to do all kinds of stuff, but she was still, she would watch TV. She would listen to the radio. She would read magazines. Never once in that six months did she ever talk to me about anything, about what our lives were like, about what our family was like, about anything. She died in her own private little world. And I understand now that that is something that some people, that's the way they deal with death. They don't want to talk to people. Uh, I think I told you the story of, uh, not lost his name, the kid that uh, was a foster kid that I knew when I was a nurse uh, and had cancer and his mother had died when she was 18 and he was just a baby, he was put into foster care. When he was 18, he was what they call, uh, he became independent because you, you graduate and uh, you age out of the foster care system when you're 18. He went on the streets in Piqua and basically got the same cancer that his mother had. 
he came back, his foster family took him in, they weren't getting paid, they just took him in as a because they loved him as a kid. And I met him because he was getting chemo treatment at the Upper Valley where I was the chemo nurse and became friends with him and I would go over and bring him food and extra stuff, anything I had extra, anything I could gather up extra because they did not have much money. He was in a, a, a trial, was supposed to be in a drug trial at the, the James Cancer Center. I dropped the ball and I feel, still feel guilty about that. His social worker was a nurse and a friend of mine and she was supposed to enroll him in that and his face was, was swollen from the chemo treatment. Uh, he was basically unrecognizable. The next time I went to see him, he looked like a normal person. And I said, boy, you really look good. Is that treatment working? And he said, she did not get me in. She forgot to enroll me in the, in the treatment and I'm not getting cancer treatment anymore. He died in three weeks. And when he died, he was put back into the hospital. I went in to visit him. The room was completely dark. He did not want to talk. He did not want to say anything. He just said, leave me alone. Some people want to be left alone. There's nothing you can do. Uh, and that still hurts. So I feel like I dropped the ball. Okay. Where are we here? Any, any other comments? So anyway, I apologize because I keep bringing up, we had a, had a real problem because I talked about the Catholics and I'm not, I don't mean to disparage the Catholics, but the Catholics have done things that are wrong. Everybody has done things that are wrong. We cannot hide those things. We have to be aware of them. We don't want to focus only on that and we don't want to overcome all the good things that are done, but we can't hide that stuff. Okay, offering. If you have something to share, please put it in the plate. If you need something, please take it out or let us know.
extinguishing the chalice, go and speak, go in peace, speak the truth. Go in peace, speak the truth, give thanks every day. Respect the earth and her creatures, for they are alive like you. Care for your body, it is a wondrous gift. Live simply, be of service, be guided by your faith and not your fear. Go lightly on your path, walk in a sacred manner. Amen. In the postlude, it's called Trees. Trees, all right. from friends of mine, even from Richmond, who have pictures of it. So well, it must talking about doing something with your cell phone, setting your cell phone on night vision or something. Yes, with no, no flash. And, well, I couldn't even see, I mean, I didn't even care if I got a picture. I just wanted to see it. Yeah. And I could see it when I looked off to the north. It, it Maybe that was my imagination. It seemed like it was lighter up in the sky, not down where the lights are from the city, but like... But maybe that was my imagination because it doesn't nothing but I saw match what I see on the pictures that people have sent. But anyway, between your ears, they got to see the Aurora Borealis. <laughs> and I forgot, uh, I'm going to leave a candle lit. Chad is the kid's name that I had my experience with. Uh, that's a name I may occasionally blank on, but I'll never forget. And I also forgot to light a candle for one of the guys that I work with. His son is, has mental problems, is on medication. He kicked the door into their house, got mad at his mom and kicked the door in, broke the door frame. I had to go over and screw the door frame back together. They called the sheriff and they've taken him to a juvenile facility until things can get straightened out. Uh, they've had trouble with this kid since he was born. He's been on different medications. He's been in different places. They cannot find the answer. They, or they And when you talk to him, on a regular basis, he like mows yards for me and paints and does odd jobs. He's like 15 years old, a big kid, big as his dad now. Uh, he comes, seems completely normal, but for some reason, when something makes him mad, he just loses all control. Uh, and he's put his hands on his mother. That's the reason they called the sheriff. I mean, she's a little tiny person. 
Um, so it's a, it's a, just a very difficult situation. So a candle for that family uh, and a candle for Chad and a candle for anybody else who has suffered uh, in silence uh, and needs our support. All right, uh, there's brewed coffee back there and still more donuts. So, and then we're gonna have a little going away bon voyage party for Dolly. <laughs> Yeah, I usually put it out. 